Hey, Cardi Gucci syndrome. Um, just as way of background, I mean, you know, we felt we, we're at war with viruses. We have to kill viruses, otherwise they kill us. Uh, and the way we do that is by recognizing viral nucleic acids, and that leads to the induction of this very powerful set of molecules referred to as type 1 interferons, and they set up an antiviral state. And that works reasonably well, although it's not perfect, as COVID shows. Um, however, there's a biological problem when you when you sort of try and kill viruses in this way, which is that you've got cells, our own cells, are full of our own DNA, DNA and RNA, and essentially... Um, they, our own nucleic acid can also trigger a similar antiviral response. But if there's no virus and it's it's from self, then it's referred to as auto-inflammation. And essentially, I think Eckhart de Gouda syndrome is a question of a mistaken identity where we misrepresent our own nucleic acid as that of the virus and induce a type 1 interferon response. And interferon is a neurotoxin um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So the disease gets its name from these two preeminent, fantastic, very important historical figures in terms of pediatric neurology, Jean-Nicard de François Goutier, and um, and then add into the mix uh, this rather wonderful and lovely um, pediatric, uh, well, a, a virologist. Um, and so it was back in 1988, actually, that, uh, that they showed that there were high levels of this interferon in the several spinal fluid and the blood of patients that were diagnosed with this new disorder, which now takes its name from Acardi and Boutier. It's a, well, it can be, uh, it's, it's, it, AGS is, is classified as a, a as a Luca dystrophy, but there are patients with mutations in genes that cause Acardi and syndrome who have completely normal brain scanners, Deepak showed with MLD. So it doesn't always seem seem to affect the white matter, but definitely there's plenty of white matter disease in a lot of patients. There's also this sort of telltale um, intracranial calcification, which again need not be present, but when it is, even these very subtle uh, little dots of calcium can orientate you uh, towards the diagnosis. So that's a very important clinical sign. And then um, my old mentors, John Tommy and John Stevenson, were the first people to describe these skin lesions. And that's relevant, as uh, as, as I'll show you a bit later on. Um, you can get lots of these nasty skin lesions. So, I, I mean, it's interesting to me hearing the earlier talks and the, the Prabhi talk and the, the MLD talk, because, you know, I was thinking, well, why isn't anyone doing gene therapy for a cardiogutty syndrome? How, how, I'm too old to reinvent myself as a gene therapy doctor, but, you know, there are other people in the world who might want to do that. I think one of the problems then is it's a highly heterogeneous disorder genetically. So there are nine genotypes that then cause uh, a cardiogutis in them. And I guess that puts some of these big companies off, some of the younger people off. I, I don't know. Um, also very phenotypically heterogeneous disorder. So you can get classical AGS. And I I actually personally sort of think one should uh, um, limit uh, perhaps the use of this term AGS to the classical acardiogutis in a phenotype. But you can get later onset disease, you can get disease which is essentially bilateral stereotonecrosis, you can get non syndromic spastic paraparesis, and then you can get disease that presents for the first time with having a completely normal. Uh, neurological development with fatal intravascular hemorrhage uh, or uh, intravascular accidents because of this SIMHD1 related cerebral vasculopathy. So, very variable, and that's a bit of a problem to come back to the pathology. And we, we think, but it's by no means proven, and um, we think that the disease, um, at least in part, is is caused by too much interferon for the reasons I, I sort of outlined in the first couple of slides. But I want to show you this. If you if you measure the level of interferon alpha, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's basically present at very low concentrations. You have to develop a we we have, we you know the, well, we with colleagues developed a very high sensitive assay for interferon alpha because 
routine analyzers won't identify the levels that are present. But, and I think that's because it's such a powerful molecule, you really just need a, a, a touch. But these are the kind of levels you find in the CNS of patients with infection, and these are the kind of levels you find in the CSF of patients with acardioglutiosinum. And levels in acardioglutiosinum are higher if you do paired sampling between the group of CSF and blood and much higher in the CSF than they are in the blood generally. So I think there is a primary intrathecal synthesis of interferon, interferon alpha, although actually I've, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know which subtype is, is doing that. But, you know, it's like these people are living with chronic viral infection in their brain, or at least in some of these people here, it's like that. So I mentioned that, it, uh, that certain... Uh, genotypes that can cause classical acardioglutisinum can also cause non-syndromic spastic paraparesis or weakness of the lower limbs with stiffness. <clears throat> and I simply mention that because if you go back to the uh, 80s and 90s, people were using interferon after the therapy for papilloma and for hemangiomas. And when you treated young patients with, uh, with interferon after, you could induce a spastic paraparesis or spastic diplegia, spastic weakness of the lower limbs and uh, you could then if you stop the treatment uh, uh, then some of these children at least uh, the phenotype reverse so quite clearly interferon alpha especially in young children is a neurotoxin and that's some evidence in favor of the uh, the reason why you might want to try and reduce the amount of interferon signaling um i said that you could get no normal brain scans you can also get this sort of nondescript you know, it could be anything kind of scan with a little bit of fluffy white matter disease. And I just mentioned then that uh, this study from um, Adeline van der Berg and her colleagues now, CHOP, and it turns out that mutations in acardioglutisinin-related genes are really quite a common cause of, of, of leukodystrophy. Um, so these are sort of, these are some kind of um, um, sort of um, reckoning of, of, of testing in in the large genomic centers in the US saying what was what 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 disorders do you find when 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 they've screened genes for and been sent to refer for leukodystrophy what do you what do you find and um, these AGS related disorders are going high this is after you've taken some of the big hitters um, but this is sort of where people haven't done any testing beforehand effectively um, and uh, well, once you well, yeah, once you've taken those, it's just everything fine. So, so really, it's an important. These are important genotypes. Um, so once you understand, once you think you understand what's going on, you can start to think about rational therapies. And one of the therapies that people have thought about is if it's about too much interferon, interferon is secreted. It uh, engages a lot. Uh, uh, a receptor, and part of that receptor of Jack is is Jack one, so there are Jack one inhibitors. So here's a child with uh, a D18N dominant negative mutation in Trax one. He's got very severe skin disease. I told you that you know, this is some part of can be part of the phenotype. And the great thing about skin, of course, is you can see it, um, and you can maybe see whether a treatment is having an effect. And that's one of the real problems that we have in a cardiogenic syndrome, I think, because of the variability in the phenotype and natural history, et cetera. Um, there's, that's day zero. Uh, that's day one, month, two and a half months after treatment with the JAK1-2 inhibitor called ruxolitinib. Really quite remarkable. So it's quite clear that these drugs affect a relevant biological mechanism. Now, the, the, the hypothesis is that they're blocking the interferon receptor, but these drugs actually do other stuff. So whether or not they're actually how that if that's how they're having an effect is is, is not completely clear. But you know they seem to do something, at least in relation to the skin. And uh, Adeline seen that in this very nice sort of large series that the largest series that published from Chop. Clearly, the skin you can have an effect. So biologically, it seems to be you seem to be barking at the right biological tree. And as a result of that, in the UK, baricitinib, which is another JAK1-2 inhibitor, has been licensed as a, a, a treatment for uh, acardioglutisinin and these other interferonopathies. But intriguingly, and only 
for reasons only known to the people that decide these things, only for children over the age of two years, whereas HF is generally a disorder occurs in the first few months of life. So there you go. Um, I'm going to tell you a story now about a child who was diagnosed with acardiogutis syndrome. And then the parents were pregnant and they had a pregnancy test and the baby was found to have the same two mutations as this child. And then this child was born and uh, we saw this child at four months and started uh, treatment with ruxolitinib at the age of five months. And then the child became symptomatic with AGS at the age of 14 months. So despite having several months of treatment with uh, a JAK inhibitor before the onset of clinical features, the child still developed the neuroclinical disease, even if it was at a later time point and an unaffected sibling. And this is just one reason why I think that these drugs are not the whole answer. Um, and one reason why they might not be the whole answer is because if you measure the amount of drug in the CSF and you compare that to the amount of drug in the plasma, it's only about 10%. Now, I don't know if that is the reason, but it seems to be one possible reason why these drugs aren't do, perhaps doing as we would like them to do. Um, an alternative is that you actually try and turn the tap off. So instead of trying to block things, you actually try and reduce the amount of endogenous nucleic acid that's uh, triggering the immune response, this putative source of endogenous nucleic acid. And we have wondered, and other people have wondered, if it might be coming from these so-called endogenous rupture elements, which make up a considerable portion of the uh, human genome. And I won't go into that, but basically we've been using drugs, uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors that are used in HIV, um, because these drugs are, are really safe and they've been used in millions of people around the world, including pregnant women, tiny babies, young children, old people. So we use triple therapy, standard HIV treatment, for children with certain genotypes where we thought that the, the logic would mean that these drugs might have an effect. And this was a paper published in 2000, or a letter published in 2018. And basically what we think we saw, uh, what the data suggests is that you could um, see a reduction in the amount of interferon signaling in blood and cerebrospinal fluid during the period of treatment that was higher than before and then left and then went up again after treatment. So basis of that, we're trying to do a different treat, a different trial using the same sort of strategy. And, and we'll see what we find. Um, there are problems with acardiogutis syndrome. Some children are born already badly damaged, so they're already affected in utero. And crudely speaking, you could argue that that's kind of sort of too late. Um, but most children seem to be apparently fine for a while and then have a neurological car crash which lasts several months and for them reasons for reasons that aren't understood they kind of re-equilibrate and the disease sort of turns itself off some people describe flares uh, over time uh, but depending on which of these models applies then you know one can think that treatment might be more useful or yes less useful um Coming back to something that Deepak was talking about, you know, the idea of 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 um, pre prenatal of of uh, postnatal uh, presymptomatic testing, and these two sort of intriguing papers that have been referred to, that have been published, where it turns out you can get kind of false negatives on a excellent ALD treat, uh, screening, which in the end turns out to be a cardiogenesis, and that's kind of intriguing. I don't understand the biology of that. Um, but what I want to point out to you is that AGS is is there's a high rate of complete clinical non-penetrance for AGS-related mutations. So in this paper where we looked at mutations in uh, MDA5 or FEH1, 13% uh, of individuals that we found, so this is a dominant disease, 13% of individuals that we found with genes with a mutation were completely asymptomatic. And some of those people were um, well beyond the age of 50. So, you know, if you're going to be picking up people with these phenotypes and maybe not, maybe the fact if you have an abnormal test like this, you, you're more likely to develop disease in, in uh, earlier on. I don't know. But, but if you're going to do gene screening early on, then um, you're going to have to think about this issue. 
And I just point out this uh, tiny thing that we just published, but uh, A177T mutation, homozygous, most common cause of AGS. It's the most common cause of AGS across any of the genotypes. And just lately, we found a number of individuals, we've come across a number of individuals who are completely asymptomatic, who have who are homozygous for that same mutation, who are a mother of 68 years of age, a mother of 36 years of age, a mother of 37 years of age. So, patients, persons, they're not patient because they don't have a phenotype, but they're, 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 they're homozygous for this mutation. So it's going to be a bit of a, a, an issue, it seems to me. Um, there's no proof that RTI has improved clinical outcome. We've only been measuring interferon levels. CHAC1 inhibition uh, addresses a relevant biological process, but seems to have limited effect on neurological outcome. I think there's an issue about CNS penetration. There are issues about variable expression. There are issues about non-penetrance. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think we're going to have to have a PGA diagnosis, but it's still going to be a problem. I think we might end up having combination therapy. I don't know. We might need to use intrathecal therapy. No one's using gene therapy. Maybe that would work. Maybe not. I don't know. But what I do know is that there will be new drugs that, according to the logic, uh, we think might be relevant in the in the, in the disease pathology. Uh, there will be these drugs. Companies are developing these drugs. And uh, so there will be opportunities to test these drugs to see whether they have a therapeutic um, benefit or not. Mm -hmm.